A very good evening to all of you. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. Well, I say a very good evening. Good evening from Madrid, Spain, where I'm uh, joining you from tonight. Uh, I guess it would be a very good afternoon to any friends in the US and maybe a good morning to any friends joining us from Asia. Um, if so, it's probably quite early over there. Um, in any case, thank you very much indeed for coming along to our webinar on um, learner experience design in ELT. This is the fourth time uh, we've done this webinar this week. Um, it's been an exhausting but exhilarating week. We've had almost 200 people come through these sessions, which has been great, and there's been lots of nice word of mouth. So um, I'll do my best not to disappoint. <laughs> very nice to see some familiar faces in the audience and lots of people as well that I don't know. Um, we're a relatively small group tonight, 36 of us. Um, <coughs> so um, hopefully that'll be fine. Um, we're going to go for about 45 minutes um, with me kind of going through um, some ideas. And then at that point, we'll leave the webinar room open for about another 15 minutes um, for Q&A, if anyone would like to ask anything. Uh, we've got my colleague Berta from ELT Jam, who's moderating tonight. If you've got any problems, just press the raise hand button and Berta will be able to, to help you out. Um, if any of you feel like tweeting, <coughs> excuse me, this is the hashtag, hashtag LXD for ELT. Do feel free to tweet. Um, as you'll see, there's no group chat functionality in GoToWebinar, unfortunately, which is a real shame. But um, we have set up a group chat conversation for after the webinar in a platform called Slack that we use at ELT Jam. It's this fantastic kind of messaging and collaboration tool. And you'll all receive an invite for that. We've got about 50 people at the moment who joined that group. So there's a kind of good community continuing on from this webinar. So hopefully long may that continue. So <coughs> what are we going to try and do today? Um, I want to try and answer two main questions, really. Um, what is learner experience design or LX design? And why does ELT need it? Or why, at least, do I think that ELT needs it? Um, if by the end of the webinar you could answer these two questions, I think that would be a sign that we'd, we'd been successful. And to drill down into these questions, to try and get to the, to the bottom of them, we're going to cover four main things. We're going to begin by just briefly looking at why this topic, why, why am I interested in this? Why is ELT Jam interested in this? Why have we chosen to talk about this? Um, so we'll begin by giving a bit of background. We're then going to dive into a bit of a, a kind of very brief but hopefully useful overview of how digital product development works. And I don't here mean specifically digital product development in English language teaching, um, but I mean just in the wider world. Um, how, do, how, do, how do most companies who make digital products make them? So I think that will provide, again, some useful context. We're then going to ask what learner experience design is trying to do. So how does learner experience design fit into product development, digital product development? What's it trying to achieve? What are the objectives? And then we're going to finish by looking at how the learner experience design process works. And basically, it's a three-step process that many of you will recognize from, from, from any design work, really. It's about identifying problems. It's about coming up with solutions for those problems. And it's about executing them well. So this is what we're going to try and cover. There's a lot to get through. It might feel at times like you're sort of drinking from a fire hydrant. Um, don't worry, you're going to be getting a copy of these slides and the full recording of the webinar as well uh, that you'll get sent through, if not later tonight, then first thing in the morning. So you'll be able to watch back. Right, let's dive in, shall we? Why this topic? Um, some of you may recognize this guy, um, especially if you're interested in the whole world of, of, of technology companies and um, kind of startups and that kind of thing. This is a guy called Peter Thiel. He was um, the co-founder and one of the original CEOs, um, of the original CEO of PayPal. I'm sure many of you are familiar with PayPal um, and have used it before. Um, he's famous for lots of things. He's a very successful entrepreneur. Um, he's written some really interesting books. And he's also famous for having this really interesting tough interview question that he would ask people um, who were interviewing for jobs with him and um, I saw this question and I, it absolutely flummoxed me because I really couldn't imagine how I was going to be able to answer a question like this in an interview so what he would ask people was this um, tell me something that is true that almost no one agrees with you on so tell me something that is true that almost no one agrees with you on and you might want to ponder for a, for a 30 seconds or so like how you would answer that question in a job interview setting i mean i you know especially if you were asked it on the spot i got thinking about this question i thought well let's take it out of the context of a job interview what, what would i say what, what what is something that i think is true about english language teaching that maybe no one agrees with me on um so i thought about it for a while and i came up with one thing and you know, I'm not 100% sure if no one would agree with me on this, but I'm pretty sure that many people would be surprised to hear me say it. So here's something I think is true. I think so far, technology has done more harm than good in ELT. Um, that's something I believe is true. And that's something that maybe if you're familiar with the ELT Jam blog and you've been following the work we've been doing for the last three years, you might be quite surprised to hear me say. Um, we've been sort of, you know, people who read the blog have, have spoken in the past about how, you know, 
ELT Jam kind of, you know, supports technology and English language teaching. We've been accused sometimes of cheerleading technology and English language teaching. Um, so this might sound off brand, maybe, or sort of not exactly the ELT Jam message. This is not the same thing as saying that technology in ELT is bad, per se. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. And if you look around, there are actually loads of great examples of technology being used incredibly well in English language teaching. And a lot of those examples come from, from the classroom. So, for example, you've got um, programs like the Plan Fibal program in Uruguay that um, many of you will be familiar with. Um, this is a picture of, of Plan Fibal provided by Graham Stanley, who works over there um, in this very important project. This is a really good example, I think, of, of, of technology implementation in in English language teaching that's doing something really good and is really helping, in this case, provide access to English language teaching to places that might not be able to get it. It's kind of widening the reach of English language teaching and is doing something really good. And there are lots of other examples of things like this. And um, a good friend of mine, Gavin Dudney, who many of you will have, will have heard of, he did a really good webinar um, last year called Of Big Data and Little Data, How Numbers Have Almost Ruined Everything, uh, where he talked at the end of it about how um, English language teachers were re reclaiming ed tech or reclaiming the educational technology space in a more grassroots way. And he talked about great initiatives like Plan Thibel with Graham Stanley. He talked about work from people like Carla Arena in Brazil, Neil Ballantyne, Russell Stannard, um, Virtue in Turkey. He talks about these really exciting things they're doing. And if you want to watch that webinar, there's a link to it there. Unfortunately, I think for most people, for most students, that is not their experience of technology in language education. I think for most people who are trying to learn English through some technology related medium, their experience looks something like this. On the left hand side here, we have a screenshot from everybody's favorite ed tech product, Duolingo. Here, um, <coughs> the students are asked to translate the sentence, her elephant eats cheese and drinks wine. Um, and on the right hand side here, we've got a screenshot from Moodle. Uh, this is an image that's provided by Lindsay Clamfield, who was talking about um, a topic related to this at the International House Barcelona conference um, a couple of weeks ago. And what we've got here, I think, are two extremes of how potentially bad things can get in the world of ed tech and ELT. On the left, you've got Duolingo with its kind of farcical content. And on the right, you've got Moodle with its terrible design, its terrible user experience, its terrible interaction, even if it's got some fairly good content. And you know, for those of you who've been following ELT Jam, you know we talked about this problem in the past and we've kind of labeled it the ed tech disconnect, so ed hyphen tech disconnect, where we've talked about how ELT digital products tend to either have, tend to have fantastic content but poor technology and user experience, or they've got the opposite problem. They've got fantastic user experience and technology and design combined with poor content. So that would be what Ed, that would be what Duolingo falls into. And some of the products that come out of the mainstream ELT publishers fall more into the camp of really good content and pedagogy, but poor design, poor user experience and poor um, use of technology. So we've talked about this before, and we've called it the EdTech disconnect. But the more I think about it, the more I think that the problem is actually more complex than just, you know, pedagogy and UX sort of fighting each other. And the more I look into it, the more I think that the reason, the issue we've got actually is that ELT has a digital product development problem. And this is what I want to sort of dive into in a little bit more depth now. So let's start by looking at, at a sort of bigger picture level of how digital product development works. Um, and I think the first important thing there is to, is to dig into this word product. Um, I think we all understand the use of the word product in general general life. You know, here's a definition that I think works. Anything that creates value by servicing a want or a need. So, for example, an iPhone is a product. Um, but the word product is used when talking about digital um, companies and digital services in, in quite a different way. It's got a much broader sense than potentially how we might understand it, which is as something physical or something tangible. So um, product these days, and you, you may have noticed that lots of job titles are coming up with the word product in it. People are now product managers, um, product owners, <coughs> these kind of things. People work for product consultancies. Um, and a product now in this kind of, in the digital age kind of is more like this. It's like a combination of a lot of different things. So often there's a hardware or a software component or both together. But the product is not just the hardware and the software, it's the business model as well. So it's about how you access that hardware or software. But it's also about customer support and customer care, or customer success as it's sometimes called. And then it's also about marketing, which is basically about sort of how people feel about your product and how much they want it. Um, if you take the iPhone, the iPhone is an interesting product to look at through this prism. So what Apple sell you is a piece of kit. It's a piece of hardware. But obviously that kit comes bundled with some incredibly powerful software as well. 
And what makes the iPhone amazing is not just that hardware and software, but it's the whole business model and the business ecosystem that sits behind it in terms of apps and the app store and all these kind of things. But then it's also about what happens if your phone goes wrong and it breaks and you can go to an Apple store and get an appointment at the Genius Bar, which is a very slick, nice way of dealing with customer support. And it's also about the marketing. It's also about all the work Apple do to make you feel a certain way about owning an iPhone and making you feel really positive about the whole experience. So even though the iPhone is a product, many people People refer to the iPhone as an experience, not just a product. So product development has got basically four main, main stages. Um, it starts at the top here in green with, with a product vision. Um, and the product vision essentially is supposed to outline how the world will be a better place if your product exists or how the world will be better, how people's lives will be better if they use your product. Um, it might sound very lofty, but that's actually a very important part of the product development process. Once you've got a product vision, you dive into a product strategy, which is basically how are you going to achieve your vision? And we're going to look at some examples of that in a sec. <clears throat> Once you've got a strategy and a vision pinned down, it's about design. And design is the stage where you decide what you're going to build. What is your product going to do? How is it going to function? What's it going to look like? All these different things. And once you've designed your product, you have to move into the execution stage, which is basically about building it. And this is all about how well you build it, how quickly you build it, and how good the quality is. So let's try and put some specifics around this process and look at some actual companies and, and, and eventually look at some, some ELT products. So let's start with the vision. Um, one, one, of the, one of the most interesting and exciting visions I've ever heard of for a company comes from Disney. Um, and Disney, Walt Disney's original founding vision for, um, for Disney was literally a happier world. That's why Disney was created. Um, and Disney's mission statement at the start, it's one of the most famous mission statements of any company, was literally make people happy. That's what Disney set out to do. And I actually love that as a, as a, as a, as a mission statement. So this was Disney's vision, a happier world. How, what strategy did they use to, 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 to deliver that? Um, well, it's going to sound very cynical in a way to describe the strategy now, but the strategy for a happier world for Disney was brands and franchises. That's what they basically did. They came up with all these brands and um, franchised them around the world, and they used that as a, as a way of spreading that happiness through the world. Uh, another company with a very famous vision, Apple. Uh, this is Steve Jobs, obviously. His vision for Apple was a computer in the hands of everyone. So when Apple was founded, he wanted to basically move computing out of the kind of business enterprise side of things and into personal computing. And the vision for that was a computer in the hands of everyone. And of course, if you look at Apple's trajectory, they ended up with the iPhone literally putting a computer in your hand, which I think was a lovely kind of twist on that original vision. And what was Apple's strategy? How did they get here? Innovate. Apple's strategy always, their entire existence, has been to innovate, to make new, to do new things, push boundaries. And that's how they managed to drag the computer industry into the personal computer industry and ultimately into smartphones and those kind of devices. One final example, for those of you who know me, you know that I love food. Um, here's an example from the world of restaurants. Um, a chef called Ferran Adria, um, a Catalan chef who owned and ran one of the greatest restaurants of all time called El Bulli in northern Catalonia. Um, he had a vision for food. He had a vision that food could be art, that food could be looked at in the same way as art is looked at. And his strategy for getting there, and the reason I mention this is because I think it's one of the best strategies I've ever heard from anyone was never copy what a great strategy if you're going to work in the creative industries your strategy becomes never copy you always have to create new so a few examples there of kind of famous company visions or product visions and and strategies for getting there so once you've got your vision and your strategy you need to think about design so basically what are you going to build and there's a great quote about design from a guy called um Sashin Reiki, who was a product manager for um, for LinkedIn, believe it or not. And he talks about, I love this quote, a compelling design delivering useful, usable, and a delightful experience. Now, I want you to pause for a second here and really focus on those three words, useful, usable, and delightful, because those are going to be three really important words as we go through the rest of this session and talk about learner experience design. So for Sashin, a product is useful, or design is useful if it solves a problem. So if it does something for somebody that makes their lives better in some way. A product is usable if it functions, if it actually works in some way. And a product is delightful if it brings some joy or happiness to the user. And as you can imagine, of those three things, delightful is the hardest to achieve. But what I think you see if you look at products is the products that do achieve delight are the ones that become phenomenons and become absolutely massive.
So once you've gone through your design phase and you've figured out what to build, you move into the execution phase. And that's all about making your product fast, making it well, and making it better. So you want to try and get your product to the market as quickly as possible. You want it to have the highest possible quality. And then you want to iterate on it to constantly make it better. Something that's really important about digital products is that they're never finished. This is a really important concept to understand. Digital products only finish when somebody puts them out of business. And so the idea in the execution phase is you just keep going around in a cycle, building and iterating and making better. So there we have it. That's kind of product development, vision, strategy, design, execution in four stages. How does this look for ELT? Well, let's take some examples. Let's look at Duolingo. This is Duolingo's vision. This is what they've stated as their vision. They want the best education for the largest number of people. It's quite a noble, a noble vision. And their strategy for getting there is to make education fun, to make it personalized, and to make it free. So it's like a three-pronged strategy. By making it free, they can get it to the greatest number of people. By making it personalized and fun, they think they can make it better. So that's their, that's their goal, really. So that's the strategy. So in terms of design, let's rate how Duolingo does in terms of those three criteria for design, usable, useful, and delightful. Well, is Duolingo usable? Yes, absolutely, it works. For those of you who've tried it, it functions. It's, it's very bug-free, it's very easy to use. Is it delightful? Does it bring joy? Well, yeah, it kind of does. I mean, look at their logo. The whole product's about delight and joy and happiness. And if you talk to users of Duolingo, as I have, you, you, what you hear them say is like, oh, yeah, I love it, or it's really addictive, or I can't stop using it. Um, I look forward to playing it. So that to me, those to me are all signs of, of delight in a product. But is it useful? Does it actually solve a problem? And here's where I think it comes down. It falls down. If its, if it's objective is to teach you a language, then it doesn't solve that problem. Because I think because of its pedagogical shortcomings, it's not ultimately going to teach your language. It's not ultimately useful. So in terms of execution, how well is Duolingo done? Has it delivered the best education? I would say no. Has it delivered it for the largest number of people? Well, maybe 100 million people have signed up for Duolingo. That's a significant number of people. So they're doing quite well, at least on that front. So let's now look at ELT Publishing as another example of this. And I didn't want to single out any specific publisher here. I wanted to sort of think about ELT publishers as a group, as a whole. So I've kind of been doing some research and looking at how the publishers are approaching digital. And what I've tried to do is come up with a kind of amalgam, which, which represents a lot of the thinking in publishers around, around digital products. So here's a vision that I think fits most ELT publishers as a whole. Learning transformed by technology, lives transformed by learning. So a lot of the publishers talk about the power of technology to transform learning, and they talk about it in a very lofty way, in a very worthwhile way, a very ambitious way. And publishers also like to talk about the power of education for, for, for transforming lives and, and, and you know, their, their role in that. So I think you've got here a fairly powerful vision for what, for what technology and education can do. A very good vision, I think. I think that this is, I mean, if I worked for a company with this vision, I think I'd be very happy about it. The problem is that a vision like this needs a strategy to match. And this is where I think the publishers are maybe having a few problems because the strategy they seem to be employing is, is this. They're basically iterating on what they do best, which is print, and trying to figure out how to make that work in the digital space. So you see lots of examples of things like blended learning, where, where, where you sort of use a, a print component alongside a digital component. You see lots of examples of taking print content and adapting it into digital format, so like ebook format or sort of online course format. And this to me you know, it's fine. It's a perfectly valid strategy if your strategy is to is to is to kind of, or if your objective is to make sure you're reusing as much of your current assets, which is a very smart thing to do from a business perspective. But is this the strategy that's going to deliver that big vision of transforming learning through technology? I, I'm not 100% convinced. So, what what do ELT publisher products tend to look like? Um, in terms of design, so are they usable? Well, yeah, generally speaking, they're usable. They um, they tend to be functional. They tend to not have many bugs and stuff, which is good. Are they delightful? I'm not convinced. I've, I'm yet to see an ELT publisher product that I would say is absolutely delightful, that would bring joy to the people learning from it. And are they useful? Well, yes and no. I think there's definitely some good products out there that would definitely help you learn English. And I think there's definitely some products out there that wouldn't, that are just not well enough designed, not compelling enough to sort of keep people coming back. So in terms of how well they're executing, 
Is learning being transformed by technology? I would say no. And are lives being transformed by learning? How do you measure that? I mean, that's always impossible to measure. So, but on based on the evidence of, of whether they're transforming learning by technology, I would say no. So you can see that we've got problems on the publisher side and we've got problems on the ed tech side. And I think in both cases, this is why we're seeing examples of bad learner experience. So people not only failing to learn something, but often having a horrible time trying because they're bored, they're not, in, they're not interested in what they're doing, the products aren't compelling, and there's no delight there. So really, this is what I think we need to try and do. We need to try and fix the design and execution problems. I think, you know, ed tech and publishing, they've got good vision. There's some potential good strategy there, although not so much, I think, from the publisher side. But in both cases, the execution and the design stage are failing. And really, this is what LX Design sets out to fix. So what's it trying to do? Um, a lot of people who signed up for this webinar, actually, um, across this week, there's lots of people from ELT Publishing, there's lots of writers, there's lots of editors, lots of teachers, but quite a few designers signed up as well. So either user experience designers or, or graphic designers who work at publishers. And um, I, I, I hope that as designers that they'll sort of like this next bit, which is sort of some thinking around the whole design process. And there's a fantastic quote that I found, for me, my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes ever on design. And it comes from this guy, Ivan Chermyev, who was one of the most famous logo designers um, in the United States. He designed all these logos on the right that many of you will recognize. Um, and here's this great quote. He says, design is directed toward human beings. To design is to solve human problems by identifying them and executing the best solution. And for, for Ivan, the, you know, I, what I love about this is that it was all about putting humans at the center of the design process and, 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 and looking at it as a problem solving activity. And I think many designers would agree with that, that essentially your job as a designer is to figure out a problem, come up with a bunch of solutions, pick the best one, and then do a really good job of of making it making it work so design is not just about aesthetics it's not just about making things look good so i hope that ivan wouldn't wouldn't object but i um i've appropriated his quote um as a sort of definition of learner experience design so for me lxd learner experience design is product design directed towards learners lxd aims to solve learner problems by identifying them and executing the best solution LXD aims to delight. So really, that's it, it in a nutshell, really. That's what this whole learner experience design process is intended to do. This is what it's here for. And it's just a, basically a three-stage process. And it's a three-stage process that any designer would recognize. You identify the problem you're trying to solve, you try and figure out some solutions, and then you do a great job of executing it at the end. So as we move into the final half here of, of what we're talking about today, let's look at the LX design process and how it works. So the first stage here is we need to think about identifying problems and how you figure out problems to solve with your product. And the way you do that is through the whole process of user research. And this is an area that I think we could really, really do better at in ELT in general. And if you want to get into user research, you're going to need a huge number of post-it notes. So that'd be the first thing on your shopping list. Um, Lots of different ways to do user research. And you'll notice that user research is very different from market research. I've deliberately not used the word market research. When you do market research, it's all about trying to come up with broad generalizations about what a market needs. So, you know, learners in Spain need X. User research is about doing something much, much more targeted. So what you want to do in user research is try and identify problems by increasing what's known as exposure hours. And exposure hours are any amount of time that you can spend watching or talking to or observing in any way the people that might end up using your product. Now, if you work in ELT publishing, if you're an ELT writer, if you work in ELT product development of any kind, there's a good chance that you came from a teaching background. And as a result, we're in a really privileged position in, in, in the ELT product development world of having spent a huge amount of our career, our early career especially, with learners in classrooms, teaching, doing the work that we're now working on in terms of content. That's a really, really good thing to have had. And my only concern with it, and I'm absolutely guilty of this myself, is that many people working in ELT product development haven't been in the classroom for a long time. And as a result, 
those exposure hours, even though there were hundreds or potentially thousands of them, they get increasingly distant. Now, this is not always the case. So I know many sort of fantastic ELT writers, um, just off the top of my head, Hugh Dell is a really good example of it, an ELT author who still teaches a lot. And there are lots of other examples as well. Um, so, and I th always think that when I look at the material from those authors, you can kind of feel it. You can kind of tell that, that, that they've spent that much, that much time recently with learners. Um, when I worked at Cambridge University Press, I always kind of deeply hoped that they would force us to go out and do more teaching because I just would never be motivated enough to do it myself. I really wish I had been. And it's something I'm incredibly guilty of now still. But I think if you're if you're interested in really getting under the skin of learners and, and figuring out what problems you want to solve, then the more chance you can spend with them in the classroom, the better, really, or even just talking to them, interviewing them. Um, and when you do this user research, when you try and get these exposure hours, you're essentially attempting to do the following things. You want to avoid going wide and shallow in your research, like I was saying with, with market research. You want to avoid saying things like Spanish learners like this or Turkish learners don't like that. Um, this is traditionally how we've done a lot of market research in ELT. And also, this is traditionally how a lot of user research has been done generally. But if you look at the way user experience research is happening at the moment, the move is definitely away from going wide and shallow towards something else instead. If you go wide and shallow looking for problems, you tend to come up with really, really big things like this. I need to speak English. You come up with the same problem for every learner. And this is kind of too diffuse a problem to try and solve with one product, essentially. It's, it's too big a thing. It's too, there's not enough to grab, grab hold of there. So instead of going wide and wide and, and shallow, the objective of user research really is to go narrow and deep. So it's to find a much narrower tranche of learners to focus on and to go into much more depth about what their problems might be. So, um, one way to do that is through the creation of what we call learner personas. And some of you may recognize this, this word persona. It's often used in user experience research and design as user persona. Um, we just use the word learner because that's what we're talking about. And we like to focus the questioning around, obviously, the learning experience and what, and what, they're, what they're doing. So here's an example of a learner persona. Um, this is Laura from Madrid. Laura does not exist. Um, well, she does and she doesn't. I mean, the woman in this photo exists, but um, her name probably isn't Laura. She's a stock photo. Um, Laura, I don't know a specific Laura from Madrid who's learning English, but I know lots of people like her. And the idea with a, with a learner persona is you want to try and find, create an archetype of a type of learner. So these are the kind of questions you want to drill down to. This is the kind of information you want to find out about Lara. So Lara wants to learn English because of this. Lara's biggest problem is that that happens. For Lara, it sucks that this is always the case. So what Lara needs is a way to do this, or what would really help Lara is a way to do that. And you want to kind of gather your information for learner personas by speaking to as many learners as possible and creating as many of these kind of archetypes as possible. And it doesn't take long for you to start being able to slot people into archetypes fairly easily. So this is a pretty standard way of, of carrying out user research. Um, it's pretty standard across all digital product development. I'm not 100% convinced that this goes deep enough. What I think is lacking from this process is, is identifying the emotional component. So what is the underlying motivation behind Lara's desire to learn English? Um, what's going to really motivate her? What's going to make her get up every day, use this product to learn English, or get up every day and go to that school to learn English and pay all that money and go through that huge, long process to do it? What's going to keep her going? And there's a few different ways you can which you can identify that emotional component. But one of my favorites and a really cool trick, and I recommend you try all of you try this if you've got learners at the moment, it's called the five whys. Okay, so what you want to do is basically ask, ask a question. So, why does Lara want to learn English? And the answer to that question is, so she can get a better job. It's a pretty standard answer to that question, I think. But then what you do is you ask another question, beginning with why. So why does she want a better job? And the answer to that, or so she can earn more money. Next question, I'm sure you can guess. Why does she want to earn more money? Well, she wants to rent her own flat. Next question, why does she want to rent her own flat? Well, she wants her own space. And the final question, why does she want her own space? She wants to be able to, to choose when to be with people. So what the five whys does is it allows you to drill down deeper into an underlying motivation. And what often happens within those five questions, and it's incredible how consistently it happens, it always gets to some kind of fairly deeply human root to whatever a problem is or whatever somebody's trying to do. So for Laura, learning English is about independence and freedom. This is what it means to her. And I think at this point, you can start to see Laura as a kind of archetype of user, somebody who, for whom learning English is a key to independence and freedom. And once you know this, 
a huge amount of the subtlety of your product design in terms of how it feels, in terms of what it does, in terms of how it motivates, in terms of how it messages people, in terms of the content it uses, can feed into this deep underlying motivation that's, that's underpinning Laura. And I think that for many of you who teach, you'll recognize that that desire for independence and freedom and, and English as a method towards getting that is really common. In Laura's case, it's being manifested through wanting a new flat. But in other learners, it could be manifested through lots of different, lots of different ways. So without understanding this emotional component, I think delight is impossible. If you remember, the three elements of assessing design are usable, useful and delightful. And I think this understanding the emotional component gets us to the delight. OK, so we look there at how the, pro the beginning of the process works. That's how you identify problems. The next stage is how you come up with solutions to those problems. And I think a good way to approach this is to try and come up with solutions that are, in inverted commas, vitamins rather than painkillers. Um, vitamin and painkiller is a quite a common way of describing how products work and, and what they do. And I'm going to explain this in more depth using a couple of examples. So let's take some products we, we probably all recognize. Um, so let's start with Facebook. How might Facebook describe itself as a vitamin product? Well, it might describe itself like this. Connecting with friends and family makes life better. So this is how Facebook would describe itself in a way that's incredibly positive and affirming and essentially is, is telling you how it improves your life and how it makes the world better. That's what a vitamin product does. How might Facebook describe itself as a painkiller? Loneliness is horrible. Don't be lonely. As you can see, this is also what Facebook does in theory. It stops you feeling lonely and isolated, but that's much less compelling as a product idea. I don't think Facebook would be anywhere near as popular it is as if it was basically selling itself as an antidote to loneliness. What about LinkedIn? Something else many of us use. LinkedIn as a vitamin. A better job means a better life. That's essentially what LinkedIn is saying in a vitamin way. But as a painkiller, LinkedIn might say, don't be unemployed and broke. Um, and again, would LinkedIn be as successful as that if it was using a painkiller idea? I'm not sure. The reason I think this is important is, is if you look at how ELT digital products describe themselves, they're almost all describing themselves as painkillers. So let's look at Duolingo. Learn language is completely free without ads or hidden charges. It's fun, easy and scientifically proven. Free, fun, easy. What that's basically saying is that English is expensive, boring and difficult. And Duolingo is the antidote to something that's expensive, boring and difficult. That's a painkiller. That The chance of that ultimately delighting me is quite low. And look at the British Council. This is the British Council Learn English website. They say, welcome to Learn English. If you want to learn English for free, you've come to the right place. This is the primary thing that's said to learners on the British Council Learn English website, that basically learning English is really expensive and we're an antidote to that. And the reason I think this is problematic is that Painkillers can't often do, don't often create those delightful products, but vitamin products can. And I think what we need to be trying to do, and one of the objectives of learner experience design, is to develop a delightful product and a product that does delight. Because I think that is something that no one's quite managed to achieve as of yet. So when it comes to designing your solution, and you're thinking on a big picture level, right, let's come up with something really positive and sort of vitamin-like, um, you need to think about what the formula for the product is going to be like. And it's likely that the solution you're looking for is going to involve in some way these four things. You're going to need a strategy for pedagogy, so how we approach the teaching, a strategy for the content the learner is going to interact with, a user experience strategy, and a social interaction strategy. So for the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to just talk through these four areas. And we're going to begin with pedagogy because for me, the pedagogy circle here is the most important one. You know, these are learning products. So without a good, strong pedagogical underpinning, we're not going to get very far at all. Um, and what's interesting is when you start looking at these four things, what becomes interesting is how they overlap with each other. And that's what we're going to kind of look at. We're going to start with pedagogy and then think about, well, how does content overlap with that? How does UX overlap with that? And how does social overlap with that? So pedagogy. Um, one of the greatest blog posts we ever hosted on ELT Jam by Mile was written by Scott Thornbury, another good friend, who, um, who wrote this great post about what the world of educational technology could learn from second language acquisition theory. And the post was called, you know, what EdTech could learn from SLA research. And what Scott did basically was look through lots of the second language acquisition research, so lots of the things we know about how people acquire languages. And then he took some of those, those, those research findings and said, well, listen, if we know this, if we know this is needed for language learning, what might this look like as a feature in a digital product? So he came up with a list of 10 things that the SLA research tells us we need. 
um, as part of our language learning. Um, lots of things you'll, rec you'll recognize here are focus on form, feedback, interaction, personalization, chunks, all these kind of things. Um, what I want to do is pull out three of these and show you how, if you take as the pedagogy is the beginning, how your content UX and social strategy can all feed into the pedagogy to make some make a product that ultimately is incredibly effective and also hopefully we hope delightful. So let's give an example of what Scott what Scott said. So he started with this quote from um, from Van Patten and Williams, who said exposure to input is necessary for language acquisition. Something I think we'd all agree with. And so Scott takes that and he says, well, listen, what might that look like as a feature in a, in, dig in a digital learning product? He says input. So is material provided for reading and or listening? And is this input rich, comprehensible and engaging? And is there a lot of input? Suddenly, if you look at this, you suddenly sort of think, well, actually, this starts looking like the objective of your content strategy for your digital product. Rich, lots of rich, comprehensible, engaging input. OK, so just hold that thought in the back of your mind for a second. He then goes on and uses this quote from Munoz from 2012. All things being equal, the more time and the more intensive the time spent learning and using the language, the better. So Scott takes this quote and says, OK, well, what does that look like in terms of a, of a feature in a, in a digital product? And he says investment. So is the software sufficiently engaging and motivating to increase the likelihood of sustained and repeated use? This, to me, suddenly starts looking like a user experience objective. So suddenly you can see how that might cross over. And then finally, he says, quoting Swain et al., learners can learn from each other during communicative interaction. And then he takes Scott takes that quote and says, interaction, is there provision for the user to collaborate and interact with other users in the target language? And suddenly this starts looking like your objective for the social interaction strategy of your digital product. So let's just look now at how those circles kind of overlap with each other. And let's begin with the topic of content. So we've got here content strategy crossing over with pedagogy strategy. What happens in that space in between those two things? So what Scott's asked for here, what he's recommended is a lot of rich, comprehensible, engaging input. And this is a real challenge and it's becoming even more difficult because for most learners now, for many people, rich, engaging input or rich, engaging content looks something like this. And this is just the logos I could fit onto one screen. Um, this, for many people, is what content looks like these days. And just look how varied that is. Look at the variety of sources and formats and types and lengths and appropriateness levels and all this kind of stuff. User generated, passed down from top, all these different things. Um, the variety of content that we have access to as humans now is absolutely insane and, and incredibly rich. And Unfortunately, at this point, we're nowhere near being able to replicate that level of richness and I think engaging level engagement with the content that we have to create for learning materials. So I think one of the challenges of your content strategy has to be, can we somehow compete with all this rich, compelling content that people are surrounded with the entire time? So I think for the content strategy, there are three things we need to think about. We need to think about content creation, but also content curation and to some extent content automation. So right now, content for learning products is almost entirely created by, by writers and a little bit of curation. So a choosing of content for other places. What I think we need to think about more is could we think about some level of automation as well, especially in the creation of the vast amounts of pretty rote standard practice material we need for language learning. We know from research that we need, that learners need vast amounts of practice. So we know we need vast amounts of gap fills and practice, you know, control practice activities and this kind of thing. There's lots of work being done at the moment, software solutions for, to come up with ways of automating that process of using corpus data, dictionary data, even scraping content from the web and using it to create some of those more mundane activities. What I would hope we could do is by, by doing that, free up time and money for more creative content work. And that creative content work being the actual creation of content from scratch, but also the curation of content from other sources. And I think, you know, investing in content partnerships, investing in, um, in, in sort of licensing, it's one thing we're going to have to think about doing. Interestingly, Cengage are very good at this. And you can see with their course they just brought out that was a, was a collaboration with TED. I think that's a really good, good example of how this curation element can start, can start feeding into materials. So there I think you can see really how, how your content strategy can sort of drive and feed into the pedagogy strategy. So what about the user experience strategy? How might that work? Um, just for those of you who are not 100% 
both they with the term user experience. Um, this is our definition of it, ELT Jam. So when the features of a system, product or service combine to enable a user to achieve a goal frictionally, frictionlessly even with accompanying delight. Um, and elements of user experience, you know, these are the things you want in your product. You want a product that's simple, easy, intuitive, logical, attractive, and efficient. This is a, these are all the hallmarks of good user experience. For me these days, these things are just bread and butter in digital products, or they should be at least. These should not be things to be celebrated. These should just be things that are just basic hygiene in the products that we make. And I love this quote from Elon Musk from Tesla, who says, any product that needs a manual to work is broken. Um, I do wonder, I mean, Joe, my colleague at ELT Jam, when he saw this quote said, I wonder if he feels the same way about the spaceship he's currently building at the moment. And if those astronauts are going to suddenly start looking for a manual at a certain point and not be able to find one, it won't be too much fun. So um, I think, you know, these, 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 these ideas of sort of like, you know, simplicity and easiness, and intuitiveness, they're all great, but they're, they're essentials and they shouldn't really necessarily, we shouldn't really need to celebrate them. And I think the user experience strategy has to go further than this. Um, if you look at how the UX strategy and the pedagogy strategy might cross over. So remember what Scott said was, is the software sufficiently engaging and motivating to increase the likelihood of sustained and repeated use? Engaging, motivating, sustained and repeated use. This looks like a user experience problem. And this looks like a problem that people have been trying to solve in other areas, specifically the areas of fitness and diet. And there's lots of apps for those of you who may have used things like Jawbone or Fitbit or the Nike Fuel Band, that are basically products designed to motivate users to do sustained and repeated action, in that case, exercise. So what might we do to think about bringing about sustained and repeated use of a product? What we tend to do is think about motivation. And this is what a lot of products do. They go in with the motivation angle. But products like, like Duolingo, especially, they only motivate very superficially um, through, through, through tools like gamification, points and leaderboards and that kind of thing. But that's a very superficial level of motivation, and it wears off really quickly. That's why the attrition rates in the products are very high. That's why there's so many people drop out. Motivation is only the first stage, really, of where I think we need to get to. I think beyond motivation, we have the next stage, which is commitment to something, and then beyond that, habit, and even beyond that, routine as well. And I think what we're talking about here is behavior change. And this is what a lot of work in user experience design is talking about at the moment. How do we facilitate behavior change and help people move to a different place? Um, there's been lots of good work written about this. Um, Lakshmi Mani wrote a great blog post about the user experience design for behavior change. And she says here at the bottom, done right, our products have the potential to promote and reinforce positive long-term habits. And this is all about design and all about how you design those processes. So when I say user experience design for behavior change, it's not the same as saying behaviorism. <laughs> for those of you who are aware of sort of some of the history of ELT of, of pedagogy in general, you'll know that um, behaviorism, very discredited pedagogy um, championed by Skinner here, this is not the same thing. This is about basically trying to feed that objective of sustained and repeated use of a product by getting people to form a habit or a routine about it. So one way of doing it is something called the Hooked Model by Nir El. There's a great book on this topic. He talks about this sort of three-stage habit formation of a cue, a routine, and a reward. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot more things like this built into learning products to really help learners stick with what they need to do, to ha stick with that investment that we know from the second language acquisition research is required, that repeated sustained use. I think we can help them do it through user experience research. And I think we need to move beyond gamification. Um, just slapping those concepts onto a product without consideration will only lead to poor product design, as Lakshmi says. And finally, as we're almost at the end, the social interaction element, the final stage of this of these four. How does social fit into this? And I think it crosses over with pedagogy and with user experience. And if you remember, this was Scott's Scott's recommendation really, is there provision for the user to collaborate and interact with other users in the target language? Um, we need to think about what collaboration looks like for people in the online space. Um, you know, we know what it looks like in the classroom. It looks like two people talking to each other. But in the digital world, collaboration looks something like this. It looks like Facebook, like Facebook Messenger, like Twitter, like WhatsApp, like WeChat, like Snapchat, like Slack, like Skype. 
it looks a certain way and it works a certain way. And we've become very familiar now with how these tools work, tools work and how they facilitate communication. Um, what I think we need to do in our social strategy is look at how these products work and how they've enabled great communication to happen and think about what elements we can take from those into our learning products. And I think ultimately what we want to move towards is less weak interaction and more strong interaction. This is something that Lindsay Clanfield is talking about quite a lot because he's writing a book on the topic with, with Jill Hadfield. Um, Lindsay talks about weak interaction being human computer interaction. So like this exercise, for example, from Duolingo is an example of weak human computer interaction and strong interaction would be human human interaction. So either student teacher or student student. And the key to this, I think, is in task design. We have to figure out how to create compelling tasks that can be carried out in the digital space using compelling tools, compelling platforms, and that will lead to more of that strong interaction. So we've come to the end, really, the final stage, which is the execution stage. And you'll be glad to know we're not going to go into that in any depth at this point because it's far too big a topic. But basically, once you've figured out the problems, figured out your solution, the execution phase is all about building fast, measuring the right things and iterating your product. Remember, we said that digital products are never finished. They just go round and round and round and on and on and better and better. And there's just a classic system that's used for this. It's called the build, measure, learn cycle. Build something, put it out into the market figure out the right thing to measure, the metrics that matter, as they're called, learn something from what you built, and then just repeat the cycle. And this, in terms of execution, is how you gr create great learner experience. You just keep putting the product out there, tweaking it, getting feedback from learners, making sure that you've got those four elements right. You know, is the UX off slightly? Is the content not working? Is the pedagogy wrong? Is there not enough social interaction? And you keep tweaking them like the lenses almost through that build, measure, learn cycle. And that's how you ultimately get to that great learner experience at the end. So, if you're interested in finding out more about this, we've done a really, really, really brief overview there, really sort of very high level. Um, we are working on another course. It's called Learner Experience Design in Practice. In that course, we're going to look into all these things, how you create effective learner personas, how you develop these, these compelling product solutions using all those different elements, how you define strategy for pedagogy, for content, for UX, for social interaction. We're then going to look at execution, like how do you build those products rapidly using lean and agile methodologies? I mean, they're there for a reason, those methodologies. They allow you to execute well well and fast and learn more and create a better product. We'll talk about measuring learner experience when we've barely touched measuring today at all. Now, can you measure a delightful experience? I think you can. I think there are ways of doing it. So we'll talk, we talk about the metrics that matter in terms of measuring learner experience. And then we talk about iterating the product. So, you know, making it better, going through cycles to try and get towards product market fit. And that's the holy grail, really. Have you built something so compelling, so delightful that your, that your market just goes crazy for it? And people just want it. And that, I think, is the ultimate aim, really, of the learner experience design. So um, if you're interested in getting a head start on this, we're doing a course um, in Barcelona as part of the Innovate ELT conference um, that's happening in May. We're doing a day of pre-conference training, including a half day uh, learner experience design course that I'll be running. Um, there are about six tickets left for that, so do pop along to the website there. It's a full day. We're doing a half-day learner experience design and a half-day course ELT in the digital age, which is kind of looking at some of the big trends affecting ELT at the moment from a technology perspective. Um, just to finish off, a couple of final words. Some acknowledgements, first of all. A lot of the thinking behind this, this, this idea has come from reading the work and, and following the work of a lot of very, very important people in the ELT and also in the, um, in the, in the product design world. So a few people here for you to follow, um, to look at and to sort of read up on. So do have a look at that when I send the slides through. And finally, if, if what you've heard today has interested you and you want to continue the conversation, we've set up a community channel on our Slack platform on ELT Jam. Um, Slack is a kind of collaboration and communication tool that allows you to change, exchange messages, share links, that kind of thing. Um, we've built a channel called LXD for ELT, um, and we've just invited anyone who's been at these webinars this week to join. Um, so far, as you'll see, as of this morning, 46 people have joined from this week, which is brilliant. There's loads of great conversation going on. If you want to join that community, just email slack at eltjam.com. You don't have to include a, a heading, a subject line, anything. Just send that through. And I'll also be including instructions for that when I send through the slides and the recording of this webinar. Um, all that leaves me to say is thank you very much indeed. Um, I know that was a whistle-stop rattling tour through the uh, world of learner experience design. Um, if there's anything you want to follow up on in terms of questions, do please email me, nick at eltjam.com. Um, or follow us on Twitter, eltjam or NMK Robinson. Um, very happy now to leave the room open for the next 10 minutes or so for some questions. Um, let me have a look. There's a question window. So if you wanted to go and have a look in there, 
Um, if there's any questions you wanted to put in, uh, Barbara, thanks for the kind words. Loved it and really inter interesting information for me. I'm glad to hear it. Um, Victoria, I missed your welcome message. Good afternoon from Argentina. Um, any questions anyone would like to pose? You are welcome to do so in the question window. Um, now, let's have a look. Right. Ah, Dorothy just said, where's the question window? Dorothy, you literally just typed a question into the question window. So <laughs> type another one there if you want to. Uh, I'm not actually sure if you guys can see it, is the only question, because I can see it from my moderator view. Um, Joe, thank you very much for the kind words. Amazing talk. Um, how do you think we can make this work in the real world? I'm thinking mobile. Well, Joe, you're not the only one. So Joe's question. So how do we think we can make this work in the real world? I'm thinking mobile. Um, Everyone's thinking mobile, Joe. Um, you know, mobile first is the mantra for a lot of product companies right now. Um, I think we're slightly behind the curve with that in ELT, and I think it's going to come. I mean, you know, the, the prediction is by 2020, there's going to be 6.1 billion smartphone users in the world. That's a pretty significant number. And a lot of companies have already started that move towards mobile first. Um, you know, Facebook are mobile first now. Obviously, products like Twitter and Instagram are as well. Um, I think we're going to have to do a huge amount of work in ELT to think about product design in, in a mobile space. And, you know, the fact is if we're looking, you know, from a pedagogical perspective to find products that will encourage sustained repeated use and will, that learners will be engaged to use, then I think we need to use the tools that we can. And I think people are, you know, hopelessly addicted to phones. I am. Um, so I think getting more learning onto phones, getting more interesting learning onto phones, getting more communicative learning onto phones. I mean, my, my only worry with what lots of the of the apps that are out at the moment, and you know, we built one and we're guilty of this as well, our app Flavoco, is they're all self-study. So they all leave out that vital social interaction phase. So can we, you know, a phone is a communicative tool. Can we harness the communicative power of a phone to make a highly communicative, brilliant, engaging, fun, addictive learning app? I mean, how can we not? I mean, that's got to be something to aim for. I'd love to see more products like that. Hopefully that answers your question to some extent. Lots of questions coming through. Um, Alex, you can't see any comments. Sorry, yeah, um, I'm going to have to read them out because I'm not sure if they're visible to you guys. Um, Ellie Murphy, thank you for the question. To what extent could we use existing tools like Skype, curation tools, social media to end up with similar product for language learning? It's what most people are always comfortable with. That's a really good question. Um, I think use them as much as we possibly can. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, not all of us are able to develop learning products, but all of us, you know, are able to create learner experiences. You don't have to be building a digital product. So whatever combination of your pedagogy, um, you know, the content you want to give your learners and the tools to communicate, so be them Skype or be it mobile phones or just be at the classroom, you can then create that user experience yourself, I think, as, as a learner. So I think, you know, those tools are brilliant. I mean, that's why they, you know, that's why they have hundreds of millions of users. I say use them to your heart's content. Um, Victoria... Uh, can you recommend a really good ELT ed tech product? Oh, someone else asked me this this week as well. Uh, you know, I, t I kind of can't. I hate to say, I hate to say that, that I can't. Um, you know, some stuff's quite cool. I mean, Duolingo has got some really cool features. It really has. It's, it's incredibly well executed. And, you know, for all the jokes about their content, um, you know, it's getting better to be to be perfectly frank and some of the elt publisher stuff's pretty good i mean it's 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 fine um but i'm struggling now to think of a single product that jumps out at me from an elt publisher that i'm like oh yeah that's absolutely brilliant um i think we're going to see more interesting stuff coming out in the future i think the general quality of digital product in general is getting so high that we're going to have to up our game a little bit to compete so sorry to not be able to demonstrate something specific um or oh, dorothy you've written a really big question um Okay, I'm going to try and read this out, so bear with me. Um, so materials writers keep hearing from publishers that digital platforms are so expensive that they have to slash royalty rates or eliminate them entirely and pay fees, but our fees have to be really low. Is this true? And B, if so, then who can create content if we can't be paid very well for the content creators? X, and that's a really good question. Um, are, are software platforms or content platforms expensive? Yes. Are they anywhere near as expensive as ELT publishers make them? No, absolutely not. The way in which dig ELT publishers have gone about, in most cases, building their platforms has almost ensured that they are incredibly expensive. Um, you know, there are ways of building software that are much, much, much more effective in terms of in terms of keeping costs down and minimizing risk. And it's building in that much smaller iterative way. It's using Agile, it's using MVPs and minimum viable product development. Um, I personally think that, you know, using that as an excuse is not is not the best way. Um, also, I don't know if every single publisher should have gone and built their own platform. 
Um, you know, there's loads of really good solutions out there that, are, that, 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 that could be used in more open platforms. And I'm not sure that every publisher got the benefit they wanted from starting from scratch building their own platform. Um, to come to the second part of your question, who should be creating content? Well, I think it's, it's it's a question of looking at the role slightly differently. Like I sort of feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a materials writer as well, um, Dorothy, as you are. And, um, you know, there's definitely been times in my writing career when I've just thought, I don't want to be writing any more practice activities. I'm bored. And I don't need to be doing this because I'm just kind of trying to invent sentences and a million sentences have already been written. Um, so I just feel like, could we take some of that work off the writers and look at the really tough stuff? So the stuff, you know, the task design. I mean, you know, what a great, important, and role that is task design and i think a lot of materials writers don't describe themselves as task designers which is a real shame because i think that's the key to really good materials is incredible tasks so i think if we can think about the curation of content like you know text and videos and that kind of thing think about that more as a kind of magpie curation thing and then think about the real creative work as being the task design around that that to me is what the future of materials writing looks like and actually to be frank that sounds a lot more fun than the work i used to do as a materials writer um victoria thank you for the kind words um useful to find brilliant thank you alex would you recommend any good products to improve alex in the efl classroom um you know, like i said it's really hard what, what i hope actually a product i hope you'll all like if you sign up is is the slack the slack platform that we use for messaging that's an example of an amazing digital product that's incredibly simple they've just got some really lovely touches delightful touches um so maybe if you want to sign up for that then um that could be a good a good thing to look at um helen hello uh do you think lines between product developers and classroom activity need to blur more these days digitally switched on teachers are experimenting and getting good results oh god absolutely yeah um what I'd love to see is more direct links between some of the grassroots technology-led stuff that's happening in the classroom with some of the bigger product development that's happening from the publishers and the edtech companies. Um, I think there's there's a sort of disconnect and there's a sort of feeling that like you know teachers doing this stuff are just hacking it together and using Skype and using these tools and it's a kind of you know it's a bit of a you know like a cut and paste job or a sticking together with sticky tape job and you know what we want is these really polished products. But I think there's a huge amount we can learn from teachers that are working under incredible constraints of either time or money um, or resources. And in fact, you know, <laughs> you know, what, what a lot of innovation in product development comes from startups and startups by definition are, you know, cash strapped, resource strapped, inexperienced companies with good ideas. And Startups that succeed manage to succeed because their ideas are so good that it kind of breaks through the constraints of their resources. And I think what I'd love to see is more of that being brought out from, from how teachers are working with technology. And in fact, for our conference in Barcelona, for the Innovate ELT conference, we picked the theme of grassroots ELT because we wanted to look more at teacher-led research, entrepreneurship, um, activism, all this kind of stuff, and try and see what was going on more at teacher level rather than looking all the time at what's going on at sort of publisher or um or edtech company level. So hopefully that answers your question, Helen. Um okay, so Victoria, there's no jurisdiction jurisdiction on social media in Argentina. What would you suggest me to use an alternative to Skype, etc.? Ooh, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of an example. I'm really sorry. Uh, if you email me, Victoria, I'll see if I can come up with something. Um Barbara, do you think that mall products tend to use ancient language theories and methods? Ooh, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I'm going to have to pass on that, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, Dorothy likes task design. Um, okay, John, nice to hear from you. I'd like to follow up on the Duolingo issue. Uh, why suggest it isn't useful? That's a good question. It motivates lots of kids to spend time besides generally. Um, okay, so John here, it's quite a long, so I'm not going to read the entire thing out. Um, John sort of standing up for Duolingo and actually, you know, very, very fair. Um, we actually had um, somebody come onto the ELT Jam blog, Jeff Jordan, who many of you may know, who um, who who writes quite polemically on the topic of ELT to review Duolingo because he comes at things from the applied linguist perspective. And he did what I hoped he would do was actually say, you know, it's not that bad. Um, John, I suppose my, my issue with that, I suppose, is that is the claim they make that you can learn a language through it. They, they make a very bold claim about, you know, the completeness of what the product can do, which is learn a language through it. And I think it's mis-selling to some extent. I mean, it evidently has some use. Um, like you said, I mean, it kind of encourages you it's kind of addictive and that kind of stuff. My worry is, is it good enough 
long term. And, you know, I've got friends who've gone through the whole of Duolingo in certain levels, like in, fr in French, for example, and gone through the entire thing and reached the kind of top level where Duolingo kind of tells you, oh, brilliant, you now speak French. And you absolutely don't speak French at that point. <laughs> so I suppose that's where, but that's where my issue comes with it. But no, I absolutely, I absolutely accept your points. Um, John, they all do that. That's true. Um, I think Duolingo, it's funny, Duolingo is the one I single out because it's the biggest and most successful. And I think as a result, it's one of the most interesting ones to look at. I mean, it is something of a phenomenon. It's absolutely got to be said. Um, so I think that's the reason I sort of tend to tend to look at that one. But of course, yeah, you could absolutely say that about almost any any product or actually any, any course book series to some extent. All right, that brings us to 10 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, for your, for your attention this evening. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, like I said, you'll be getting an email probably in the morning with um, a link to a recording of this webinar and a link to a PDF of all the slides. Uh, you'll also have details in there um, where you can talk about, so where you can find out um, how to access the Slack channel. But if you can't wait for that, just email slack at eltjam.com and I'll add you on. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Berta for her moderating. And um, I'll, see, I'll see some of you, I suppose, at either TESOL US or IATEFL. Thank you very much. Cheers.